So far from this world of education and global social justice, there lays this unknown mysterious world of hermaphrodite, or better known as Khwaja Siras, as we, what we understand. The reality of their existence in a society is still a secret, but their omnipresence here is unavoidable. They have and will always remain an integral part of our culture. Strangely, when the entire world is immersed in fighting for the laws and rights of homosexuals and bisexuals, first in Canada and now in India, Khwaja Sirai in Pakistan are still living under the shadow of rejection from every basic human rights. Uh, in this part of the world where we have forgotten that they're also human beings more than anything else and they also have equal rights like us. But they face a very bleak future without any access to education or employment opportunities. I won't deny they do get some attention, but that is only limited to an extent of them becoming a topic of research and exploration because of their strange appearances or the secret lives that they live. They meet ridicule from a society and people like us who do not understand them, which makes them or leaves them with no opportunity to access public education or public health or well-being or anything else, even access to public toilets and transport. We, I don't know if you guys noticed or not while um, Ifat was presenting, there was a sign of males and females but nothing about the transgender, yeah? Now, because of these reasons, it, they become the most marginalized, ill-treated, and deprived communities in Pakistan. And I am here to talk about an idea of how we can unlearn these prejudices, how we can learn to open up and accept them as part of our culture. Now, why is that important? Because gender stereotyping fuels discrimination, and discrimination often leads to violence and abuse of many sorts, which we have started to see a lot these days. Now, considering this gender debate, it may be difficult, or it sometimes we are ignorant of what we understand to be sex and gender. So it may be helpful if you can briefly define what is sex and gender. So sex is a biological classification of people as male, female or intersex, scientifically called hermaphrodite, which is assigned to us at the time of birth, based on anatomy and biology. But gender, however, is a social classification, which is assigned to us by the society. And the opportunities that are associated with either being a male or a female. However, there are certain conditions where the biological aspect of the gender is put to challenge with the social and psychological aspect. Now, society like ours, we do not go beyond the understanding of gender because we have never been taught, we have never been educated, so we don't understand the dynamics. We have, our understanding is only limited to the binary classification, a male and a female, nothing beyond about the third gender. So, how can we unlearn these prejudices? Being a transgender is a person who identify themselves as male to female, which is having female appearances and attributes, or female to male, which means having male attributes and appearances. But however, they contain the elements of both, which makes them neither a male nor a female. So if they are neither, who are they? And why are they so badly treated in a society and not given equal opportunity? The country's transgender population stands at about 10,418, which is 0.0005% of the total population of 217 million in Pakistan. Yeah? In response to this, transgender activists claimed and challenged these numbers to be misleading and incorrect. They said, according to an estimate, there are more than one million trans population across Pakistan. Okay? Now, officials from PBS, in their defense, said that disabled people were counted in a specific category, regardless of whatever gender they had, which led to the miscalculation of the trans population. Now, these numbers only elevated the problem further, because government won't allocate any budgets or make no reforms for their education or employment because their presence in the population was extremely negligible. I mean, 0.005%. I don't even remember what that number was. So all of this, again, further leads to a stigma of them being characterized as mentally ill, socially deviant, and more importantly, sexually predatory, which often puts them at the risk of human trafficking also. So I have a lot of questions first. 
Whose fault is it? Us or them? Us because we are never taught or educated gender beyond male and female, and anybody who does not fall into these domains are aliens. Or media. What is the role of media in portraying a positive image of them or educating the masses about them? In May 2018, the National Assembly enacted a law, the Transgender Persons Protection of the Act. The main, bill, uh, the main provision of the bill validated their identity and reclaimed their rights under the Pakistan's constitution, which they never got to enjoy. Why? Because they were outright denied of existence, let alone have any rights. But is law enough for us to accept and respect them? We are not sure. Because we clearly don't follow the traffic rules, we clearly don't pay our taxes. So how can law be enough? But I personally think this is lack of, due to lack of our education and ignorance that they have faced this severe discrimination and systematic inequality from public education to healthcare to well-being, even, again, inclusions in the public spaces. We've made transgender communities so isolated and excluded them from our uh, societies and the systems that we forget that they have also equal rights. So we started to reach out to a lot of um, youth because we wanted this hatred to go away and we wanted to target and the um, transgender community and make their voices be heard. So we started reaching the youth, who are civic-minded individuals, more aware, more vocal, and more concerned about the societal issues these days, but more importantly, highly digitally impressionable. So we asked them to work with us on three areas, empathy, education, and employment, to empower the transgender community. But how did that happen? Before we even reached out to the transgender, we wanted to show our target audiences a bigger picture of them. So we collaborated with a lot of NGOs who used to work with the trans rights to recruit a few of them to be part of us, part of our campaigns. So the transgender community initially were reluctant because their hesitance and discomfort was understandable. They didn't want to be part of it, but eventually, we went with the low-hanging fruits and went with the uh, transgender community who were ready to share our personal stories with us. And we made them part of our guest speaker sessions. We created digital stories because we wanted to voice their concerns and challenges, the hate and discrimination that they face, and what do they expect from us as fellow human beings. So the influence gradually worked, and that attracted a lot more people within the community to come forward and become part of our digital stories. The empathy at that point in time was contagious, and we wanted everyone to be infected. Moving forward, since we've excluded them from our uh, society, from our system, we wanted everybody to be part of this. Before it became a normal culture, we wanted it to become a popular culture. Because if public like us and people like us were not comfortable with their presence, employers won't hire them and universities will not enroll them. Yeah? Easier said than done? No. We were bashed. We were discouraged. We were demotivated. We received a lot of hate speech on our social media pages. We were lectured on morality. We were accused of going against the religion. But more than that, what we received was love, compassion, motivation, encouragement, and support in many forms. From public, from universities, from media, from um, government authorities, and more importantly, a lot of corporate organizations later on uh, to be part of this. Now, at that, again, point in time, uh, we conducted a research where 80% of the sample transgender population was willing to leave their current occupations and adopt socially respectable professions and jobs. So, okay, we went ahead and approached a lot of corporate organizations, a lot of companies, to give them this opportunity, to give them this particular chance rather than just claiming that they're equal opportunity employers. Simultaneously, we also reached media to start portraying a positive image of them and start talking about how they're going to face these challenges as part of the society. We were delighted. We were delighted that people empathize. We were delighted that people were ready to make them part of us. But there was a problem. There was a huge gap. 
To be employed in a lot of these companies, they needed a certain level of education, they needed a certain level of talent, they needed a certain level of skill set, which they completely lack. And we wanted to bridge this gap, we wanted to fill in this gap. So we started to enroll them in vocational trainings, we started to uh, enroll them in skill-based courses, and some language programs as well, to not just groom them and prepare them for the corporate world or face these real-world challenges, or fill this huge gap, but also for self-reliance. We partnered and collaborated with a lot of institutions who would subsidize the cost for us. We requested them because we wanted to accommodate a lot of more people within the community. But what we received was, uh, from them was a lot more than that. Not just the support system, but also the commitment to ensure to provide a conducive and a safe learning environment for them. And that was the game changer for us. The transgender community was hurt, we had burst some myths, we had clarified some misconceptions, and in, in, in the meanwhile, the transgender community was also uh, being in, um, interacted with the general public, so the, the, the icebreaker had already happened. So we went ahead and started training them, started grooming them for the corporate world, for the real world challenges, the schools were there, the education was happening. Uh, again, what we saw later on was a much needed impact for ourselves more than the transgender community or for the public. The impact worked. One of the local cafes in Karachi trained and hired them, and that was the icing on the cake that kept us moving, that kept us moving forward. Now, within a society like ours, where the challenges and these gender and social identities have always been a problem, because we do not think about the third gender or go beyond these binary systematic understanding of the gender. What do we do in situations like that? Although it was all digitally done, so people showed their love and care and empathy through the digital platforms. But moving forward, since we have excluded them from our society since ages, we want to encourage parents, we want to change their mindsets, we want to change their behaviors to not abandon their children because they are born that way but accept them. We want to train the teachers to change the classroom culture and make it more welcoming for the new students and more comfortable for the current students. So we move ahead for the real world educational challenges in the mainstream degree programs for the transgender community. We want to collaborate with the HR departments of a lot of corporate and government organizations to start training their employees towards this inclusion, again for the mainstream jobs. We want to influence the government to finally start allocating some budget and make reforms for their education and employment and start making policies for the inclusion in the public spaces. But more importantly and critically, we want all of us to stop feeling awkward. We are the ones who are going to change this culture and we are the ones who are going to make them part of us. We are the ones who are going to bring this change. But Back to why I'm here and why and how we can unlearn these prejudices. Let's begin with giving them back their rights to access social and economic opportunities. Let's be comfortable with an idea to study, work, or just have a cup of coffee with or around them. Let's start to first understand ourselves and then teach our younger generation, our children, about gender dynamics beyond this binary. We have to educate them about the third gender, which is all natural and they're born that way, which are the misconceptions we had to clear during our entire process. And if nothing else, and if we can't do anything else, at least just recognize them and treat them as human and respect them as human. I'm about to talk about how we went ahead and um, envisioned a society like this. The first for us had already started to happen. The looking, at, uh, looking at the recent uh, developments that has happened so far, it makes me hopeful. We have the first transgender school opened up in Lahore. Although that is not exactly the idea of inclusion that I'm talking about, we are still excluding them, but the first has to happen somewhere. We have the first transgender model, we have the first transgender anchor person, and we have the first transgender barista. We took half a century to realize and work on women empowerment until we had the first women to reach the moon and we had the first female prime minister. But the first for them has already started to happen. And that is what makes me hopeful.
We envision a society where all identity groups and everybody is represented equally and valued equally. And for that, we need an inclusive attitude. A society cannot flourish if it cannot look success and happiness beyond gender, and if it cannot treat every member of a society with respect and with equality. For me, an inclusive society is the only way forward. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.